Section 10 of The World's Famous Orations, Volume 3. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The World's Famous Orations, Volume 3. John Milton, Plea for the Liberty of Unlicensed Printing, Part 1. Footnote. The date of this, the most celebrated of Milton's prose works, is November 24, 1644. In disregard of an ordinance of Parliament of the previous year, Milton in July had published without license his pamphlet concerning divorce. For this he had been attacked, and a search had been made for the printers. In consequence of this, he wrote the Areopagitica, which he described as a speech for the liberty of unlicensed printing to the Parliament of England. Abridged. Born in 1608, died in 1674, visited Italy in 1638, began his political writings in 1640, Latin secretary to the Commonwealth in 1649, became totally blind in 1652, spared at the Restoration under the Indemnity Act, published Paradise Lost in 1667. 1644 They who do states and governors of the commonwealth direct their speech, high court of parliament, or, wanting such access in a private condition, write that which they foresee may advance the public good. I suppose them, as at the beginning, of no mean endeavor, not a little altered and moved inwardly in their minds, some with doubt of what will be the success, others with fear of what will be the censure, some with hope, others with confidence of what they have to speak. And me, perhaps, each of these dispositions, as the subject was whereon I entered, may have at other times variously affected, and likely might in these foremost expressions now also disclose which of them swayed most, but that the very attempt of this address thus made, and the thought of whom it hath recourse to, hath got the power within me to a passion far more welcome than incidental to a preface which though I stay not to confess ere any task, I shall be blameless if it be no other than the joy and gratulation which it brings to all who wish and promote their country's liberty, whereof this whole discourse proposed will be a certain testimony, if not a trophy. For this is not the liberty which we can hope, that no grievance ever should arise in the commonwealth, that let no man in this world expect. But when complaints are freely heard, deeply considered, and speedily reformed, then is the utmost bond of civil liberty attained that wise men look for. To which, if I now manifest by the very sound of this which I shall utter, that we are already in the good part arrived, and yet from such a steep disadvantage of tyranny and superstition grounded in our principles, as was beyond the manhood of a Roman recovery, it will be attributed first, as is most due, to the strong assistance of God our Deliverer, next to your faithful guidance and undaunted wisdom, lords and commons of England. Neither is it in God's esteem the diminution of his glory, when honorable things are spoken of good men and worthy magistrates. Which if I now first should begin to do after so fair a progress of your laudable deeds, and such a long obligement upon the whole realm to your indefatigable virtues, I may be justly reckoned among the tardiest and the unwillingness of them that praise ye. Nevertheless, there being three principal things without which all praising is but courtship and flattery, First, when that only is praised which is solidly worth praise. Next, when greatest likelihoods are brought that such things are truly and really in those persons to whom they are ascribed. The other, when he who praises, by showing that such his actual persuasion is of whom he writes, can demonstrate that he flatters not. The former two of these I have heretofore endeavored, rescuing the employment from him who went about to impair your merits with a trivial and malignant encomium, the latter is belonging chiefly to mine own acquittal, that whom I so extolled I did not flatter hath been reserved opportunely to this occasion. For he who freely magnifies what hath been nobly done, and fears not to declare as freely what might be done better, gives ye the best covenant of his fidelity, and that his loyalest affection and his hope waits on your proceedings. His highest praise is not flattery, and his plainest advice is a kind of praising. For though I should affirm and hold by argument that it would fare better with truth, with learning, and the commonwealth, if one of your published orders which I should name were called in, 
yet at the same time it could not but much redound to the luster of your mild and equal government when as private persons are hereby animated to think ye better pleased with public advice than other statists have been delighted heretofore with public flattery and men will then see what difference there is between the magnanimity of a triennial parliament and that jealous haughtiness of prelates and cabin counsellors that usurped of late when as they shall observe ye in the midst of your victories and successes more gently brooking written exceptions against a voted order than other courts which had produced nothing worth memory but the weak ostentation of wealth would have endured the least signified dislike at any sudden proclamation if i should thus far presume upon the meek demeanour of your civil and gentle greatness lords and commons as what your published order hath directly said that to gainsay i might defend myself with ease if any should accuse me of being new or insolent did they but know how much better i find ye esteem it to imitate the old and elegant humanity of greece than the barbaric pride of a hunnish and norwegian stateliness and out of those ages to whose polite wisdom and letters we owe that we are not yet goths and jutlanders i could name him who from his private house wrote that discourse to the parliament of athens that persuades them to change the form of democracy which was then established footnote isocrates the work referred to is the one from which milton obtained his own title the logos areopagiticus in footnote such honour was done in those days to men who professed the study of wisdom and eloquence not only in their own country but in other lands that cities and seigneuries heard them gladly and with great respect if they had aught in public to admonish the state thus did dion prusaeus a stranger and a private orator counsel the rhodians against a former edict and i abound with other like examples which to set here would be superfluous i know not what should withhold me from presenting ye with a fit instance wherein to show both the love of truth which ye eminently profess and that uprightness of your judgment which is not wont to be partial to yourselves by judging over again that order which you have ordained to regulate printing that no books pamphlets or paper shall be henceforth printed unless the same be first approved and licensed by such or at least one of such as shall be thereto appointed for that part which preserves justly every man's copy to himself or provides for the poor i touch not only to wish that they be not made pretences to abuse and persecute honest and painful men who offend not in either of these particulars but that other clause of licensing books which we thought had died when his brother quadragesimal and matrimonial when the prelates expired i shall now attend with such a homily as shall lay before ye first the inventors of it to be those whom ye will be loath to own next what is to be thought in general of reading whatever sort the books be and that this order avails nothing to the suppressing of scandalous seditious and libelous books which were mainly intended to be suppressed last that it will be primely to the discouragement of all learning and the stop of truth not only by disexercising and blunting our abilities in what we know already but by hindering and cropping the discovery that might be yet further made both in religious and civil wisdom i deny not but that it is of greatest concernment in the church and commonwealth to have a vigilant eye how books demean themselves as well as men and thereafter to confine in prison and do sharpest justice to them as malefactors for books are not absolutely dead things but do contain a potency of life in them to be as active as that soul whose progeny they are nay they do preserve as in a vial the purest efficacy and extraction of that living intellect that bred them i know they are as lively and as vigorously productive as those fabulous dragon's teeth and being sewn up and down may chance to spring up armed men and yet on the other hand unless wariness be used as good almost kills a man as kill a good book who kills a man kills a reasonable creature god's image but he who destroys a good book kills reason itself kills the image of god as it were in the eye many a man lives a burden to the earth but a good book is the precious life-blood of a master spirit embalmed and treasured up on a purpose to a life beyond life tis true no age can restore a life whereof perhaps there is no great loss and revolutions of ages do not oft recover the loss of a rejected truth for the want of which whole nations fare the worse we should be wary therefore what persecution we raise against the living labours of public men how we spill that seasoned life of man preserved and stored up in books since we see a kind of homicide may be thus committed sometimes a martyrdom and if it extend to the whole impression a kind of massacre whereof the execution ends not in the slaying of an elemental life 
but strikes at that ethereal and fifth essence, the breath of reason itself, slays an immortality rather than a life. But lest I should be condemned of introducing license while I oppose licensing, I refuse not the pains to be so much historical as will serve to show what hath been done by ancient and famous commonwealths against this disorder, till the very time that this project of licensing crept out of the Inquisition, was catched up by our prelates, and hath caught some of our presbyters. We have it not that can be heard of, from any ancient state or polity or church, nor by any statute left us by our ancestors, elder or later, nor from the modern custom of any reformed city or church abroad, but from the most anti-Christian council, and the most tyrannous inquisition that ever inquired. Till then, books were ever as freely admitted into the world as any other birth. The issue of the brain was no more stifled than the issue of the womb. No envious Juno sat cross-legged over the nativity of any man's intellectual offspring. But if it proved a monster, who denies but that it was justly burnt or sunk into the sea? But that a book in worse condition than a peccant soul should be to stand before a jury ere it be born to the world, and undergo yet in darkness the judgment of Radamanth and his colleagues, ere it can pass the ferry backward into light, was never heard before till that mysterious iniquity provoked and troubled at the first entrance of reformation, sought out new limbos and new hells wherein they might include our books also within the number of their damned. And this was the rare morsel so officiously snatched up and so ill-favouredly imitated by our inquisitoriant bishops, and the attendant minorities, their chaplains, that ye like not now these most certain authors of this licensing order, and that all sinister intention was far distant from your thoughts when ye were importuned the passing it, all men who know the integrity of your actions and how ye honour truth, will clear ye readily. But some will say, what though the inventors were bad, the thing, for all that, may be good. It may be so. Yet if that thing be no such deep invention, but obvious and easy for any man to light on, and yet best and wisest commonwealths through all ages and occasions have forbore to use it, and falsest seducers and oppressors of men were the first who took it up, and to no other purpose but to obstruct and hinder the first approach of reformation, I am of those who believe it will be a hardier alchemy than Lulius ever knew to sublimate any good use out of such an invention. Footnote. Raymond's Lully, the famous Spanish alchemist who became a missionary to the Mohammedans in Asia and Africa. End footnote. Yet this only is what I request to gain from this reason, that it may be held a dangerous and a suspicious fruit, as certainly it deserves for the tree that bore it, until I can dissect one by one the properties that it has. Books are as meats and viands are, some of good, some of evil substance, and yet God in that unapocryphal vision said without exception, Rise, Peter, kill and eat, leaving the choice to each man's discretion. Wholesome meats to a vitiated stomach differ little or nothing from unwholesome and best books to a naughty mind are not unappliable to occasions of evil. Bad meats will scarce breed good nourishment in the healthiest concoction. But herein the difference is of bad books, that they do to a discreet and judicious reader serve in many respects to discover, to confute, to forewarn, and to illustrate. Whereof what better witness can ye expect I should produce than one of your own now sitting in Parliament? The chief of learned men reputed in this land, Mr. Selden, whose volume of natural and national laws proves, not only by great authorities and brought together, but by exquisite reasons and theorems almost mathematically demonstrative, that all opinions, yea, errors, known, read, and collected, are of main service and assistance toward the speedy attainment of what is truest. Footnote. De jure naturae, etc., John Selden is best remembered now for his Table Talk, which was published thirty-five years after his death. His other works are twenty-six in number. End footnote. I conceive, therefore, that when God did enlarge the universal diet of man's body, saving ever the rules of temperance, he then also as before left arbitrary the dieting and repasting of our minds, as wherein every mature man might have to exercise his own leading capacity. How great a virtue is temperance! how much of moment through the whole life of man. Yet God commits the managing so great a trust without particular law or prescription wholly to the demeanour of every grown man. And therefore when he himself tabled the Jews from heaven, that omer which was every man's daily portion of manna, is computed to have been more than might have well sufficed for the hardiest feeder thrice as many meals. 
for those actions which enter into a man rather than issue out of him, and therefore defile not, God uses not to captivate under a perpetual childhood of prescription, but trusts him with the gift of reason to be his own chooser. There were but little work left for preaching, if law and compulsion should grow so fast upon those things which heretofore were governed only by exhortation. Solomon informs us that much reading is a weariness to the flesh. But neither he nor other inspired author tells us that such or such reading is unlawful. Yet certainly had God thought good to limit us herein, it had been much more expedient to have told us what was unlawful than what was wearisome. Good and evil we know in the field of this world grew up together almost inseparably, and the knowledge of good is so involved and interwoven with the knowledge of evil, and in so many cunning resemblances hardly to be discerned, that those confused seeds which were imposed upon Psyche as an incessant labor to call out and sort asunder, were not more intermixed. It was from out the rind of one apple tasted that the knowledge of good and evil, as two twins cleaving together, leaped forth into the world. And perhaps this is that doom which Adam fell into of knowing good and evil, that is to say, of knowing good by evil. As therefore the state of man now is, what wisdom can there be to choose, what continence to forbear without the knowledge of evil? He that can apprehend and consider vice with all her baits and seeming pleasures, and yet abstain, and yet distinguish, and yet prefer that which is truly better, he is the true wayfaring Christian. I cannot praise a fugitive and cloistered virtue, unexercised and unbreathed, that never sallies out and sees her adversary, but slinks out of the race where that immortal garland is to be run for, not without dust and heat. Assuredly we bring not innocence into the world, we bring impurity much rather. That which purifies us is trial, and trial is by what is contrary. That virtue, therefore, which is but a youngling in the contemplation of evil, and knows not the utmost that vice promises to her followers, and rejects it, is but a blank virtue, not a pure. Her whiteness is but an excremental whiteness. Which was the reason why our sage and serious poet Spencer, whom I dare be known to think a better teacher than Scotus or Aquinas, describing true temperance under the person of Guion, brings him in with him Palmer through the cave of Mammon, and the bower of earthly bliss, that he might see, and know, and yet abstain. Since therefore the knowledge and survey of vice is in this world so necessary to the constituting of human virtue, and the scanning of error to the confirmation of truth, how can we more safely and with less danger scout into all the regions of sin and falsity than by reading all manner of tractates, and hearing all manner of reason? And this is the benefit which may be had of books promiscuously read. Seeing, therefore, that those books and those in great abundance which are likeliest to taint both life and doctrine cannot be suppressed without the fall of learning, and of all ability and disputation, and that these books of either sort are most and soonest catching to the learned, from whom to the common people whatever is heretical or dissolute, may quickly be conveyed, and that evil manners are as perfectly learnt without books a thousand other ways which cannot be stopped, an evil doctrine not with books can propagate except a teacher guide, which he might also do without writing. And so beyond prohibiting I am not enabled to unfold how this caudalous enterprise of licensing can be exempted from the number of vain and impossible attempts. And he who were pleasantly disposed could not well avoid to liken it to the exploit of that gallant man who thought to pound up the crows by shutting his park gate. Besides another inconvenience, if learned men be the first receivers out of books and dispreaders of both vice and error, how shall the licensers themselves be confided in? Unless we can confer upon them, or they assume to themselves above all others in the land the grace of infallibility and uncorruptedness. And again, if it be true that a wise man like a good refiner can gather gold out of the drossiest volume, and that a fool will be a fool with the best book, yea, or without book, there is no reason that we should deprive a wise man of any advantage to his wisdom while we seek to restrain from a fool that which being restrained will be no hindrance to his folly. For if there should be so much exactness always used to keep that from him which is unfit for his reading, we should, in the judgment of Aristotle, not only, but of Solomon and of our Saviour, not vouchsafe him good precepts, and by consequence not willingly admit him to good books as being certain that a wise man will make better use of an idle pamphlet, than a fool will do of sacred scripture. Tis next alleged we must not expose ourselves to temptations without necessity, and next to that not employ our time in vain things. To both these objections one answer will serve. 
out of the grounds already laid that to all men such books are not temptations nor vanities but useful drugs and materials wherewith to temper and compose effective and strong medicines which man's life cannot want the rest as children and childish men who have not the art to qualify and prepare these working minerals may well be exhorted to forbear but hindered forcibly they cannot be by all the licensing that sainted inquisition could ever yet contrive which is what i promise to deliver next that this order of licensing conduces nothing to the end for which it was framed and hath almost prevented me by being clear already while thus much hath been explaining see the ingenuity of truth who when she gets a free and willing hand opens herself faster than the pace of method and discourse can overtake her it was the task which i began with to show that no nation or well instituted state if it valued books at all did ever use this way of licensing and it might be answered that this is a piece of prudence lately discovered to which i return that as it was a thing slight and obvious to think on so if it had been difficult to find out there wanted not among them long since who suggested such a course which they not following leave us a pattern of their judgment that it was not the not knowing but the not approving which was the cause of their not using it if we think to regulate printing thereby to rectify manners we must regulate all recreations and pastimes all that is delightful to man no music must be heard no song be said or sung but what is grave and doric there must be licensing dancers that no gesture motion or deportment be taught our youth but what by their allowance shall be thought honest for such plato was provided of it will ask more than the work of twenty licensers to examine all the lutes the violins and the guitars in every house they must not be suffered to prattle as they do but must be licensed what they may say and who shall silence all the airs and madrigals that whisper softness in chambers the windows also and the balconies must be thought on there are shrewd books with dangerous frontispieces set to sale. Who shall prohibit them? Shall twenty licensers? The villages also must have their visitors to inquire what lectures the bagpipe and the rebeck reads, even to the ballantry and the gamut of every municipal fiddler, for these are the countryman's Arcadias and his Montemayors. Next, what more national corruption for which England hears ill abroad than household gluttony? who shall be the rectors of our daily rioting and what shall be done to inhibit the multitudes that frequent those houses where drunkenness is sold and harbored our garments also should be referred to the licensing of some more sober workmasters to see them cut into a less wanton garb who shall regulate all the mixed conversation of our youth male and female together as is the fashion of this country who shall still appoint what shall be discoursed what presumed and no further lastly who shall forbid and separate all idle resort, all evil company? These things will be and must be, but how they shall be least hurtful, how least enticing, herein consists the grave and governing wisdom of a state. If every action which is good or evil in man at ripe years were to be under pittance and prescription and compulsion, what were virtue but a name? What praise could then be due to well-doing? What gramercy to be sober, just, or continent? Many there be that complain at divine providence for suffering Adam to transgress. Foolish tongues. When God gave him reason, he gave him freedom to choose, for reason is but choosing. He had been else a mere artificial Adam, such an Adam as he is in the motions. We ourselves esteem not of that obedience or love or gift which is of force. God therefore left him free, set before him a provoking object ever almost in his eyes, herein consisted his merit herein the right of his reward the praise of his abstinence wherefore did he create passions within us pleasures round about us but that these rightly tempered are the very ingredients of virtue they are not skilful considerers of human things who imagine to remove sin by removing the matter of sin for besides that it is a huge heap increasing under the very act of diminishing though some part of it may for a time be withdrawn from some persons it cannot from all in such a universal thing as books are and when this is done yet the sin remains entire though ye take from a covetous man all his treasure he has yet one jewel left you cannot bereave him of his covetousness banish all objects of lust shut up all youth into the severest discipline that can be exercised in any hermitage ye cannot make them chaste that came not thither so so great care and wisdom is required to the right managing of this point suppose we could expel sin by this means look how much we thus expel of sin 
so much we expel of virtue for the matter of them both is the same remove that and ye remove them both alike this justifies the high providence of god who though he commands us temperance justice continence yet pours out before us even to a profuseness all desirable things and gives us minds that can wander beyond all limit and satiety yet though ye should condescend to this which god forbid the order still would be but fruitless and defective to that end whereto ye meant it if to prevent sex and schisms who is so unread or so uncatchetized in story that hath not heard of many sects refusing books as a hindrance and preserving their doctrine unmixed for many ages only by unwritten traditions the christian faith for that was once a schism is not unknown to have spread all over asia ere any gospel or epistle was seen in writing if the amendment of manners be aimed at look into italy and spain whether those places be one scruple the better the honester the wiser the chaster since all the inquisitional rigor that hath been executed upon books end of section ten recording by philip gould section eleven of the world's famous orations volume three this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org the world's famous orations volume three john milton plea for the liberty of unlicensed printing part two another reason whereby to make it plain that this order will miss the end it seeks consider by the quality which ought to be in every licenser it cannot be denied but that he who is made judge to sit upon the birth or death of books whether they may be wafted into this world or not had need to be a man above the common measure both studious learned and judicious there may be else no mean mistakes in the censure of what is passable or not which is also no mean injury if he be of such worth as behooves him there cannot be a more tedious and unpleasing journey work a greater loss of time levied upon his head than to be made the perpetual reader of unchosen books and pamphlets oft times huge volumes there is no book that is acceptable unless at certain seasons but to be enjoined the reading of that at all times and in a hand scarce legible whereof three pages would not down at any time in the fairest print is an imposition which i cannot believe how he that values time and his own studies or is but of a sensible nostril should be able to endure in this one thing i crave leave of the present licensers to be pardoned for so thinking who doubtless took this office up looking on it through their obedience to the parliament whose command perhaps made all things seem easy and unlaborious to them but that this short trial hath wearied them out already their own expressions and excuses to them who make so many journeys to solicit their license are testimony enough seeing therefore those who now possess the employment by all evident signs wish themselves well rid of it and that no man of worth none that is not a plain unthrift of his own hours is ever likely to succeed them except he mean to put himself to the salary of a press corrector we may easily foresee what kind of licensers we are to expect hereafter either ignorant imperious and remiss or basely pecuniary this is what i had to show wherein this order cannot conduce to that end whereof it bears the intention what advantage is it to be a man over it is to be a boy at school if we have only escaped the ferula to come under the fescue of an imprimatur if serious and elaborate writings as if they were no more than the theme of a grammar lad under his pedagogue must not be uttered without the cursory eyes of a temporizing and extemporizing licenser he who is not trusted with his own actions his drift not being known to be evil and standing to the hazard of law and penalty has no great argument to think himself reputed in the commonwealth wherein he was born for other than a fool or a foreigner when a man writes to the world he summons up all his reason and deliberation to assist him he searches meditates is industrious and likely consults and confers with his judicious friends after all which done he takes himself to be informed in what he writes as well as any that writ before him if in this the most consummate act of his fidelity and ripeness no years no industry no former proof of his abilities can bring him to that state of maturity as not to be still mistrusted and suspected 
unless he carry all his considerate diligence, all his midnight watchings and expense of Palladian oil, to the hasty view of an unleisured licenser, perhaps much his younger, perhaps far his inferior in judgment, perhaps one who never knew the labor of book-writing, and if he be not repulsed or slighted must appear in print like a puny with his guardian, and the censor's hand on the back of his title, to be his bail and surety that he is no idiot or seducer. It cannot be but a dishonor and a derogation to the author, to the book, to the privilege and dignity of learning. And what if the author shall be one so copious of fancy as to have many things well worth the adding come into his mind after licensing, while the book is yet under the press, which not seldom happens to the best and diligentest writers, and that perhaps a dozen times in one book? The printer dares not go beyond his licensed copy. So often then must the author trudge to his leave-giver that those his new insertions may be viewed, and many a jaunt will be made ere that licenser, for it must be the same man, can either be found or found at leisure. Meanwhile either the press must stand still, which is no small damage, or the author lose his accuratest thoughts and send the book forth worse than he had made it, which to a diligent writer is the greatest melancholy and vexation that can befall. Nay, which is more lamentable, if the work of any deceased author, though never so famous in his lifetime, and even to this day come to their hands for license to be printed or reprinted, if there be found in his book one sentence of a venturous edge, uttered in the height of zeal, and who knows whether it might not be the dictate of a divine spirit, yet not suiting with every low decrepit humor of their own, though it were Knox himself, the reformer of a kingdom, that spake it, they will not pardon him their dash. The sense of that great man shall to all posterity be lost for the fearfulness, or the presumptuous rashness, of a perfunctory licenser. And to what an author this violence hath lately been done, and in what book of greatest consequence to be faithfully published, I could now instance, but shall forbear till a more convenient season. Yet if these things be not resented seriously and timely by them who have the remedy in their power, but that such iron moulds as these shall have authority to gnaw out their choicest periods of exquisitest books, and to commit such a treacherous fraud against the orphan remainders of worthiest men after death, the more sorrow will belong to that hapless race of men whose misfortune it is to have understanding. Henceforth let no man care to learn or care to be more than worldly wise, for certainly in higher matters to be ignorant and slothful, to be a common steadfast dunce, will be the only pleasant life, and only in request. And as it is a particular disesteem of every knowing person alive and most injurious to the written labors and monuments of the dead, so to me it seems an undervaluing and vilifying of the whole nation. I cannot set so light by all the invention, the art, the wit, the grave and solid judgment which is in England, as that it can be comprehended in any twenty capacities how good soever much less that it should not pass except their superintendence be over it, except it be sifted and strained with their strainers, that it should be uncurrent without their manual stamp. Truth and understanding are not such wares as to be monopolized and traded in by tickets and statutes and standards. We must not think to make a staple commodity of all the knowledge in the land, to mark and license it like our broadcloth and our wool-packs. What is it but a servitude like that imposed by the Philistines not to be allowed the sharpening of our own axes and coulters? But we must repair from all quarters to twenty licensing forges. Nor is it to the common people less than a reproach. For if we be so jealous over them that we dare not trust them with an English pamphlet, what do we but censure them for a giddy, vicious, and ungrounded people, in such a sick and weak state of faith and discretion, as to be able to take nothing down but through the pipe of a licenser. That this is care or love of them we cannot pretend, when as in those popish places where the laity are most hated and despised, the same strictness is used over them. Wisdom we cannot call it, because it stops but one breach of license, nor that neither, when as these corruptions which it seeks to prevent break in faster at other doors which cannot be shut. And lest some should persuade ye, lords and commons, that these arguments of learned men's discouragement at this your order are mere flourishes, and not real, 
I could recount what I have seen and heard in other countries where this kind of inquisition tyrannizes, when I have sat among their learned men, for that honour I had, and been counted happy to be born in such a place, of philosophic freedom as they supposed England was, while themselves did nothing but bemoan the servile condition into which learning among them was brought, that this was it which damped the glory of Italian wits, that nothing had been there written now these many years but flattery and fustian. There it was that I found and visited the famous Galileo, grown old a prisoner to the Inquisition, for thinking in astronomy otherwise than the Franciscan and Dominican licensers thought. Footnote. This meeting occurred at Florence in March 1639. Milton again refers to it in Paradise Lost. Galileo was then living in Florence under a sort of commutation of his original sentence of imprisonment. End footnote. And though I knew that England then was groaning loudest under the prelatical yoke, nevertheless I took it as a pledge of future happiness that other nations were so persuaded of her liberty. Yet it was beyond my hope that those worthies were then breathing in her air, who should be her leaders to such a deliverance, as shall never be forgotten by any revolution of time that this world hath to finish. When that was once begun, it was as little in my fear that what words of complaint I heard among learned men of other parts uttered against the Inquisition, the same I should hear by as learned men at home, uttered in the name of Parliament against an order of licensing and that so generally that, when I had disclosed myself a companion of their discontent, I might say, if without envy, that he whom an honest questorship had endeared to the Sicilians was not more by them importuned against Verres than the favourable opinion which I had among many who honour ye, and are known and respected by ye, loaded me with entreaties and persuasions that I would not despair to lay together that which just reason should bring into my mind, toward the removal of an undeserved thraldom upon learning. Footnote. Cicero's oration against Verus is in part given in the second volume of these orations. End footnote. That this is not, therefore, the disburdening of a particular fancy, but the common grievance of all those who had prepared their minds and studies above the vulgar pitch to advance truth in others, and from others to entertain it, thus much may satisfy and in their name I shall for neither friend nor foe conceal what the general murmur is, that if it come to inquisitioning again and licensing, and that we are so timorous of ourselves and so suspicious of all men, as to fear each book and the shaking of every leaf before we know what the contents are, if some who but of late were little better than silenced from preaching shall come now to silence us from reading except what they please, it cannot be guessed what is intended by some but a second tyranny over learning and will soon put it out of controversy, that bishops and presbyters are the same to us both name and thing, that those evils of prelatry, which before from five or six and twenty sees were distributively charged upon the whole people, will now light wholly upon learning, is not obscure to us. When is now the pastor of a small unlearned parish on the sudden shall be exalted archbishop over a large diocese of books, and yet not remove, but keep his other curé too, a mystical pluralist. He who but of late cried down the sole ordination of every novice bachelor of art, and denied sole jurisdiction over the simplest parishioner, shall now at home in his private chair assume both these over worthiest and excellentest books and ablest authors that write them. Well knows he who uses to consider that our faith and knowledge thrives by exercise, as well as our limbs and complexion. Truth is compared in Scripture to a streaming fountain. If her waters flow not in a perpetual progression, they sicken into a muddy pool of conformity and tradition. A man may be a heretic in the truth, and if he believe things only because his pastor says so, or the assembly so determines, without knowing other reason, though his belief be true, yet the very truth he holds becomes his heresy. Nor much better will be the consequence even among the clergy themselves. It is no new thing never heard of before for a parochial minister, who has his reward and is at his Hercules pillars in a warm benefice, to be easily inclinable, if he have nothing else that may rouse up his studies, to finish his circuit in an English concordance and a topic folio, the gatherings and savings of a sober graduateship, a harmony and a catena. 
treading the constant round of certain common doctrinal heads, attended with the uses, motives, marks, and means, out of which, as out of an alphabet or sulfa, by forming and transforming, joining and disjoining variously a little bookcraft and two hours' meditation, might furnish him unspeakably to the performance of more than a weekly charge of sermoning, not to reckon up the infinite helps of interlinearies, breviaries, synopses, and other loitering gear. But as for the multitude of sermons ready printed and piled up on every text that is not difficult, our London trading St. Thomas in his vestry, and add to boot St. Martin and St. Hugh, have not within their hallowed limits more vendable ware of all sorts ready made, so that penury he never need fear of pulpit provision, having so plenteously to refresh his magazine. But if his rear and flanks be not impaled, if his back door be not secured by the rigid licenser, but that a bold book may now and then issue forth and give the assault to some of his old collections in their trenches, it will concern him then to keep waking, to stand and watch, to set good guards and sentinels about his received opinions, to walk the round and counter-round with his fellow inspectors, fearing lest any of his flock be seduced, who also then would be better instructed, better exercised and disciplined. And God send that the fear of this diligence, which must then be used, do not make us affect the laziness of a licensing church. There is yet behind of what I purpose to lay open the incredible loss and detriment that this plot of licensing puts us to. More than if some enemy at sea should stop up all our havens and ports and creeks. It hinders and retards the importation of our richest merchandise, truth. Nay, it was first established and put in practice by anti-Christian malice and mystery on set purpose to extinguish, if it were possible, the light of reformation and to settle falsehood, little differing from that policy wherewith the Turk upholds his Alcoran by the prohibition of printing. Tis not denied, but gladly confessed we are to send our thanks and vows to heaven louder than most of nations, for that great measure of truth which we enjoy, especially in those main points between us and the Pope, with his appurtenances the prelates, but he who thinks we are to pitch our tent here, and have attained the utmost prospect of reformation that the mortal glass wherein we contemplate can show us, till we come to a beatific vision, that man by this very opinion declares that he is yet far short of truth. Truth indeed came once into the world with her divine master, and was a perfect shape most glorious to look on. But when he ascended, and his apostles after him were laid asleep, then straight arose a wicked race of deceivers, who, as that story goes of the Egyptian Typhon with his conspirators, how they dealt with the good Osiris, took the virgin truth, hewed her lovely form into a thousand pieces, and scattered them to the four winds. From that time ever since, the sad friends of truth, such as durst appear, imitating the careful search that Isis made for the mangled body of Osiris, went up and down, gathering up limb by limb, still as they could find them. We have not yet found them all, lords and commons, nor ever shall do, till her master's second coming. He shall bring together every joint and member, and shall mould them into an immortal feature of loveliness and perfection. Suffer not these licensing prohibitions to stand at every place of opportunity, forbidding and disturbing them that continue seeking, that continue to do our obsequies to the torn body of our martyred saint. We boast our light. But if we look not wisely on the sun itself, it smites us into darkness. Who can discern those planets that are oft combust, and those stars of brightest magnitude that rise and set with the sun until the opposite motion of their orbs bring them to such a place in the firmament, where they might be seen evening or morning? The light which we have gained was given us not to be ever staring on, but by it to discover onward things more remote from our knowledge. It is not the unfrocking of a priest, the unmitering of a bishop, and the removing him from off the Presbyterian shoulders, that will make us a happy nation. No, if other things as great in the church and in the rule of life, both economical and political, be not looked into and reformed, we have looked so long upon the blaze that Zwingli and Calvin hath beaconed up to us, that we are stark blind. Lords and commons of England, consider what nation it is whereof ye are and whereof ye are the governors, a nation not slow and dull, but of a quick, ingenious, and piercing spirit, 
acute to invent, subtle and sinewy to discourse, not beneath the reach of any point, the highest that human capacity can soar to. Therefore the studies of learning in her deepest sciences have been so ancient and so eminent among us, that writers of good antiquity and ablest judgment have been persuaded that even the school of Pythagoras and the Persian wisdom took beginning from the old philosophy of this island. And that wise and civil Roman, Julius Agricola, who governed once here for Caesar, preferred the natural wits of Britain before the labored studies of the French. Nor is it for nothing that the grave and frugal Transylvanian sends out yearly from as far as the mountainous borders of Russia and beyond the Hercynian wilderness, not their youth, but their staid men to learn our language and our theologic arts. Yet that which is above all this, the favor and the love of heaven, we have great argument to think in a peculiar manner propitious and propending toward us. Why else was this nation chosen before any other, that out of her, as out of Zion, should be proclaimed and sounded forth the first tidings and trumpet of reformation to all Europe? And had it not been the obstinate perverseness of our prelates against the divine and admiral spirit of Wycliffe, to suppress him as a schismatic and innovator, perhaps neither the Bohemian Huss and Jerome, no, nor the name of Luther or of Calvin, had been ever known. The glory of reforming all our neighbors had been completely ours. But now, as our obdurate clergy have with violence demeaned the matter, we are become hitherto the latest and backwardest scholars of whom God offered to have made us the teachers. Now once again, by all concurrence of signs, and by the general instinct of holy and devout men as they daily and solemnly express their thoughts, God is decreeing to begin some new and great period in his church, even to the reforming of Reformation itself. What does he then but reveal himself to his servants, and as his manner is, first to his Englishmen? I say, as his manner is first to us, though we mark not the method of his counsels, and are unworthy. Behold now this vast city, a city of refuge, the mansion-house of liberty encompassed and surrounded with his protection. The shop of war hath not there more anvils and hammers waking, to fashion out the plates and instruments of armed justice in defense of beleaguered truth, that there be pins and heads there, sitting by their studious lamps, musing, searching, revolving new motions and ideas wherewith to present, as with their homage and their fealty, the approaching reformation. Others is fast reading, trying all things ascending to the force of reason and convincement. What could a man require more from a nation so pliant and so prone to seek after knowledge? What wants there to such a towardly and pregnant soil but wise and faithful laborers to make a knowing people, a nation of prophets, of sages, and of worthies? We reckon more than five months yet to harvest. There need not be five weeks, had we but eyes to lift up. The fields are white already. Where there is much desire to learn, there of necessity will be much arguing, much writing, many opinions. For opinion in good men is but knowledge in the making. Under these fantastic terrors of sect and schism, we wrong the earnest and zealous thirst after knowledge and understanding which God hath stirred up in this city. What some lament of we rather should rejoice at, should rather praise this pious forwardness among men to reassume the ill-reputed care of their religion into their own hands again. A little generous prudence, a little forbearance of one another, and some grain of charity might win all these diligences to join and unite in one general and brotherly search after truth. Could we but forego this prelatical tradition of crowding free consciences and Christian liberties into canons and precepts of men? I doubt not if some great and worthy stranger should come among us wise to discern the mould and temper of a people and how to govern it, observing the high hopes and aims, the diligent alacrity of our extended thoughts and reasonings in the pursuance of truth and freedom, but that he would cry out as Pyrrhus did, admiring the Roman docility and courage. If such were my epaurats, I would not despair the greatest design that could be attempted to make a church or kingdom happy. What should ye do then? Should ye suppress all this flowery crop of knowledge, and in new light sprung up, and yet springing daily in this city? Should ye set an oligarchy of twenty engrossers over it, to bring a famine upon our minds again, when we shall know nothing but what is measured to us by their bushel? Believe it, lords and commons, they who counsel you to such a suppressing, do as good as bid ye suppress yourselves, and I will soon show how. 
If it be desired to know the immediate cause of all this free writing and free speaking, there cannot be assigned a truer than your own mild and free and humane government. It is the liberty, lords and commons, which your own valorous and happy councils have purchased us, liberty which is the nurse of all great wits. This is that which hath rarefied and enlightened our spirits like the influence of heaven. This is that which hath enfranchised, enlarged, and lifted up our apprehensions degrees above themselves. Ye cannot now make us less capable, less knowing, less eagerly pursuing of the truth, unless ye first make yourselves, that made us so, less the lovers, less the founders of our true liberty. We can grow ignorant again, brutish, formal, and slavish, as ye found us. But you then must first become that which ye cannot be, oppressive, arbitrary, and tyrannous, as they were from whom ye had freed us. That our hearts are now more capacious, our thoughts more erected to the search and expectation of greatest and exactest things, is the issue of your own virtue propagated in us. You cannot suppress that unless ye reinforce an abrogated and merciless law, that fathers may dispatch at will their own children. And who shall then stick closest to ye and excite others? Not he who takes up arms for code and conduct, and his four nobles of Danegelt. Although I dispraise not the defense of just immunities, yet love my peace better if that were all. Give me the liberty to know, to utter, and to argue freely according to conscience above all liberties. And now the time in special is, by privilege, to write and speak what may help to the further discussing of matters in agitation. The temple of Janus, with his two controversial faces, might now not unsignificantly be set open, and though all the winds of doctrine were let loose to play upon the earth, so truth be in the field we do injuriously by licensing and prohibiting, to misdoubt her strength. Let her in falsehood grapple, whoever knew truth put to the worse in a free and open encounter. For who knows not that truth is strong next to the Almighty? She needs no policies, nor stratagems, nor licensing to make her victorious. Those are the shifts and the defenses that error uses against her power. Give her but room, and do not bind her when she sleeps. For then she speaks not true as the old Proteus did, who spake oracles only when he was caught and bound. But then rather she turns herself into all shapes except her own and perhaps tunes her voice according to the time, as Micaiah did before Ahab, until she abjured into her own likeness. Yet it is not impossible that she may have more shapes than one. What else is all that rank of things indifferent wherein truth may be on this side or on the other without being unlike herself? What but a vain shadow else is the abolition of those ordinances, that handwriting nailed to the cross? What great purchase is this Christian liberty which Paul so often boasts of? His doctrine is that he who eats or eats not, regards a day or regards it not, may do either to the Lord. How many other things might be tolerated in peace and left to conscience had we but charity, and were it not the chief stronghold of our hypocrisy to be ever judging one another? There have been not a few since the beginning of this Parliament, both of the Presbytery and others, who by their unlicensed books to the contempt of an imprimatur, first broke that triple ice clung about our hearts and taught the people to see day. I hope that none of those were the persuaders to renew upon us this bondage which they themselves have wrought so much good by condemning. But if neither the check that Moses gave to young Joshua, nor the counterman which our Saviour gave to young John, who was so ready to prohibit those whom he thought unlicensed, be not enough to admonish our elders, how unacceptable to God their testy mood of prohibiting is, if neither their own remembrance what evil hath abounded in the church by this let of licensing, and what good they themselves have begun by transgressing it, be not enough, but that they will persuade and execute the most Dominican part of the Inquisition over us, and are already with one foot in the stirrup so active at suppressing. It would be no unequal distribution in the first place to suppress the suppressors themselves, whom the change of their condition hath puffed up, more than their late experience of harder times hath made wise. And as for regulating the press, let no man think to have the honour of advising ye better than yourselves have done in that order published next before this, that no book be printed unless the printer's and the author's name, or at least the printer's, be registered. 
those which otherwise come forth if they be found mischievous and libelous the fire and the executioner will be the timeliest and the most effectual remedy that man's prevention can use for this authentic spanish policy of licensing books if i have said aught will prove the most unlicensed book itself within a short while and was the immediate image of a star chamber decree to that purpose made in those very times when that court did the rest of those her pious works for which she is now fallen from the stars with lucifer whereby ye may guess what of state prudence what love of the people what care of religion or good manners there was at the contriving although a singular hypocrisy it pretended to bind books to their good behaviour and how it got the upper hand of your precedent order so well constituted before if we may believe those men whose profession gives them cause to inquire most it may be doubted there was in it the fraud of some old patentees and monopolizers in the trade of bookselling who under pretence of the poor in their company not to be defrauded and the just retaining of each man his several copy which god forbid should be gainsaid brought divers glows and colours to the house which were indeed but colours and serving to no end except it be to exercise a superiority over their neighbours men who do not therefore labour in an honest profession to which learning is indebted that they should be made other men's vassals another end is thought was aimed at by some of them in procuring by petition this order that having power in their hands malignant books might the easier scape abroad as the event shows but of these sophisms and elenchus of merchandise i skill not this i know that errors in a good government and in a bad are equally almost incident for what magistrate may not be misinformed and much the sooner if liberty of printing be reduced into the power of a few but to redress willingly and speedily what hath been erred and in highest authority to esteem a plain advertisement more than others have done a sumptuous bribe is a virtue honoured lords and commons answerable to your highest actions and whereof none can participate but greatest and wisest men end of section eleven recording by philip gould section twelve of the world's famous orations volume three this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Gloria Keave, March 2018. The World's Famous Orations, Volume 3. At the Opening of Parliament Under the Protectorate by Oliver Cromwell. Footnote. Delivered on September 4, 1654, Cromwell having been installed as Lord Protector on December 16 of the previous year. Meanwhile, with Parliament in abeyance, the creative period in Cromwell's government had been begun, but the duration of his policy, foreign as well as domestic, depended on its acceptance by the nation as represented in the new Parliament. End a footnote. Born in 1599, died in 1658, elected to Parliament in 1628, made Captain of Parliamentary Horse in 1642, organized his Ironsides in 1643, made lieutenant-general in 1645, signed the death warrant of Charles I in 1649, in control of the government in 1649, went to Ireland in 1650, commander-in-chief in 1650, won the Battle of Dunbar in 1650, of Worcester in 1651, expelled the rump parliament in 1653, made Lord Protector in 1653. Gentlemen, you are met here on the greatest occasion that I believe England ever saw. Having upon your shoulders the interests of three great nations with the territories belonging to them, and truly I believe I may say without any hyperbole, you have upon your shoulders the interest of all the Christian people in the world and the expectation is that i should let you know as far as i have cognizance of it the occasion of your assembling together at this time it hath been very well hinted to you this day that you come hither to settle the interests above mentioned for your work here in the issue and consequences of it will extend so far even to all christian people in the way and manner of my speaking to you i shall study plainness and to speak to you what is truth and what is upon my heart and what will in some measure reach to these great concernments 
after so many changes and turnings which this nation hath labored under to have such a day of hope as this is and such a door of hope opened by god to us truly i believe some months since would have been beyond all our thoughts i confess it would have been worthy of such a meeting as this is to have remembered that which was the rise of and gave the first beginning to all these troubles which have been upon this nation and to have given you a series of the transactions not of men but of the providence of god all along unto our late changes as also the ground of our first undertaking to oppose that usurpation and tyranny which was upon us both in civils and spirituals and the several grounds particularly applicable to the several changes that have been but i have two or three reasons which divert me from such a way of proceeding at this time if i should have gone in that way then that which lies upon my heart as to these things which is so written there that if i would blot it out i could not would itself have spent this day the providences and dispensations of god have been so stupendous what i judge to be the end of your meeting the great end which was likewise remembered to you this day to wit is healing and settling the remembering of transactions too particularly perhaps instead of healing at least in the hearts of many of you might set the wound fresh a bleeding and i must profess this unto you whatever thoughts pass upon me that if this day if this meeting prove not healing what shall we do but as i said before i trust it is in the minds of you all and much more in the mind of god to cause healing it must be first in his mind and he being pleased to put it into yours this will be a day indeed and such a day as generations to come will bless you for i say for this and the other reasons i have forborne to make a particular remembrance and enumeration of things and of the manner of the lord's bringing us through so many changes and turnings as have passed upon us howbeit i think it will be more than necessary to let you know at least so well as i may and what condition this nation or rather these nations were when the present government was undertaken and for order's sake it's very natural to consider what our condition was in civils and then also in spirituals what was our condition every man's hand almost was against his brother at least his heart was little regarding anything that should cement and might have a tendency in it to cause us to grow into one all the dispensations of god his terrible ones when he met us in the way of his judgment in a ten years civil war and his merciful ones they did not they did not work upon us no but we had our humours and interests and indeed i fear our humours went for more with us than even our interests certainly as it falls out in such cases our passions were more than our judgments was not everything almost grown arbitrary who of us knew where or how to have right done him without some obstruction or other intervening indeed we were almost grown arbitrary in everything what was the face that was upon our affairs as to the interest of the nation as to the authority in the nation to the magistracy to the ranks and orders of men whereby england hath been known for hundreds of years a nobleman a gentleman a yeoman the distinction of these that is a good interest of the nation and a great one the natural magistracy of the nation was it not almost trampled under foot under despite and contempt by men of levelling principles i beseech you for the orders of men and ranks of men did not that levelling principle tend to the reducing of all to an equality did it consciously think to do so or did it only unconsciously practise toward that for property and interest at all events what was the purport of it but to make the tenant as liberal a fortune as the landlord which i think if obtained would not have lasted long the men of that principle after they have served their own turns would then have cried up to property and interest fast enough this instance is instead of many and that the thing did and might well extend far is manifest 
because it was a pleasing voice to all poor men and truly not unwelcome to all bad men to my thinking this is a consideration which in your endeavours after settlement you will be so well minded of that i might have spared it here but let that pass and now as to spirituals indeed in spiritual things the case was more sad and deplorable still and that was told to you this day eminently the prodigious blasphemies contempt of god and christ denial of him contempt of him and his ordinances and of the scriptures a spirit visibly acting those things foretold by peter and jude yea those things spoken of by paul to timothy paul declaring some things to be worse than the anti-christian state of which he had spoken in first timothy chapter four verses one and two under the title of the latter times tells us what should be the lot and portion of the last times he says in second timothy chapter three verses two through four in the last days perilous times shall come men shall be lovers of their own selves covetous boasters proud blasphemers disobedient to parents unthankful and so on but in speaking of the anti-christian state he told us in first timothy chapter four verses one and two that in the latter days that state shall come in not the last days but the latter wherein there shall be a departing from the faith and a giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils speaking lies and hypocrisy and so on this is only his description of the latter times or those of antichrist and we are given to understand that there are last times coming which will be worse and surely it may be feared these are our times for when men forget all rules of law and nature and break all the bonds that fallen man hath on him obscuring the remainder of the image of god in their nature which they cannot blot out and yet shall endeavour to blot out having a form of godliness without the power surely these are sad tokens of the last times and indeed the character wherewith this spirit and principle is described in that place of scripture is so legible and visible that he who runs may read it to be among us for by such the grace of god is turned into wantonness and christ and the spirit of god made a cloak for all villainy and spurious apprehensions and though nobody will own these things publicly as to practice the things being so abominable and odious yet the consideration how this principle extends itself and whence it had its rise makes me think of a second sort of men tending in the same direction who it is true as i said will not practice or own these things yet can tell the magistrate that he hath nothing to do with men holding such notions these forsooth are matters of conscience and opinion they are matters of religion what hath the magistrate to do with these things he is to look to the outward man not to the inward and so forth and truly it so happens that though these things do break out visibly to all yet the principle wherewith these things are carried on so forbids the magistrate to meddle with them that it hath hitherto kept the offenders from punishment such considerations and pretensions to liberty of conscience what are they leading us toward liberty of conscience and liberty of the subject two as glorious things to be contended for as any that god hath given us yet both these abused for the patronizing of villainies insomuch that it hath been an ordinary thing to say and in dispute to affirm that the restraining of such pernicious notions was not in the magistrate's power he had nothing to do with it not so much as the printing of a bible in the nation for the use of the people was competent to the magistrate lest it should be imposed upon the consciences of men for they would receive the same traditionally and implicitly from the magistrate if it were thus received the aforementioned abominations did thus swell to this height among us 
we may reckon among these our spiritual evils an evil that hath more refinedness in it more colour for it and hath deceived more people of integrity than the rest have done for few have been catched by the former mistakes except such as have apostatized from their holy profession such as being corrupt in their consciences have been forsaken by god and left to such noisome opinions but i say there is another error of more refined sort which many honest people whose hearts are sincere many of them belonging to god have fallen into and that is the mistaken notion of the fifth monarchy footnote the fifth monarchy men were second adventists they believed in a literal second coming of christ and that it was their duty to establish a kingdom for him by force this kingdom was to be the fifth in a series of which the four others were assyria persia greece and rome End of footnote. fifth monarchy a thing pretending more spirituality than anything else a notion i hope we all honour and wait and hope for the fulfilment of that jesus christ will have a time to set up his reign in our hearts by subduing those corruptions and lusts and evils that are there which now reign more in the world than i hope in due time they shall do and when more fullness of the spirit is poured forth to subdue iniquity and bring in everlasting righteousness then will the approach of that glory be the carnal divisions and contentions among christians so common are not the symptoms of that kingdom but for men on this principle to be titled themselves that they are the only men to rule kingdoms govern nations and give laws to people and determine of property and liberty and everything else upon such a pretension as this is truly they had need to give clear manifestations of god's presence with them before wise men will receive or submit to their conclusions nevertheless as many of these men have good meanings which i hope in my soul they have it will be the wisdom of all knowing and experienced christians to do as jude saith jude when he reckoned up those horrible things done upon pretenses and haply by some upon mistakes of some says he have compassion making a difference others save with fear pulling them out of the fire i fear they will give too often opportunity for this exercise but i hope the same will be for their good if men do but so much as pretend for justice and righteousness and be of peaceable spirits and will manifest this let them be the subjects of the magistrate's encouragement and if the magistrate by punishing visible miscarriages save them by that discipline god having ordained him for that end i hope it will evidence love and not hatred so to punish where there is cause indeed this is that which doth most declare the danger of that spirit for if these were but notions i mean these instances i have given you of dangerous doctrines both in civil things and spiritual if i say they were but notions they were best let alone notions will hurt none but those that have them but when they come to such practices as telling us for instance that liberty and property are not the badges of the kingdom of christ when they tell us not that we are to regulate law but that law is to be abrogated indeed subverted and perhaps wish to bring in the judaical law instead of our known laws settled among us this is worthy of every magistrate's consideration especially where every stone is turned to bring in confusion i think i say this will be worthy of the magistrate's consideration while these things were in the midst of us and while the nation was rent and torn in spirit and principle from one end to the other after this sort and manner i have now told you family against family husband against wife parents against children and nothing in the hearts and minds of men but overturn 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 a scripture phrase very much abused and applied to justify unpeaceable practices by all men of discontented spirits the common enemy sleeps not 
our adversaries in civil and religious respects did take advantage of these distractions and divisions and did practice accordingly in the three nations of england scotland and ireland we know very well that emissaries of the jesuits never came in such swarms as they have done since those things were set on foot and i tell you that diverse gentlemen here can bear witness with me how that they the jesuits have had a consistory abroad which rules all the affairs of things in england from an archbishop down to the other dependents upon him and they had fixed in england of which we are able to produce the particular instruments in most of the limits of their cathedrals or pretended dioceses an episcopal power with archdeacons etc and had persons authorized to exercise and distribute those things who pervert and deceive the people and all this while we were in that sad and as i said deplorable condition and in the meantime all endeavours possible were used to hinder the work of god in ireland and the progress of the work of god in scotland by continual intelligences and correspondences both at home and abroad from hence into ireland and from hence into scotland persons were stirred up from our divisions and discomposure of affairs to do all they could to ferment the war in both these places to add yet to our misery whilst we were in this condition we were in a foreign war deeply engaged in war with the portuguese whereby our trade ceased the evil consequences by that war were manifest and very considerable and not only this but we had a war with holland consuming our treasure occasioning a vast burden upon the people a war that cost this nation full as much as the whole taxes came on to the navy being a hundred and sixty ships which cost this nation above one hundred thousand pounds a month besides the contingencies which would make it one hundred twenty thousand pounds that very one war did engage us to so great a charge at the same time also we were in a war with france the advantages that were taken of the discontents and divisions among ourselves did also ferment that war and at least hinder us of an honourable peace every man being confident we could not hold out long and surely they did not calculate amiss if the lord had not been exceedingly gracious to us i say at the same time we had a war with france and besides the sufferings in respect to the trade of the nation it is most evident that the purse of the nation could not have been able much longer to bear it by reason of the advantages taken by other states to improve their own and spoil our manufacture of cloth and hinder the vent thereof which is the great staple commodity of this nation such was our condition spoiled in our trade and we at this vast expense thus dissettled at home and having these engagements abroad things being so and i am persuaded it is not hard to convince every person here they were so what a heap of confusions were upon these poor nations and either things must have been left to sink into the miseries these premises would suppose or else a remedy must be applied a remedy hath been applied that hath been this government a thing i shall say little unto the thing is open and visible to be seen and read by all men and therefore let it speak for itself only let me say this because i can speak it with comfort and confidence before a greater than you all that in the intention of it as to the approving of our hearts to god let men judge as they please it was calculated with our best wisdom for the interest of the people for the interest of the people alone and for their good without respect had to any other interest and if that be not true i shall be bold to say again let it speak for itself truly i may i hope humbly before god and modestly before you say somewhat on the behalf of the government not that i would discourse of the particular heads of it but acquaint you a little with the effects it has had 
and this not for ostentation's sake but to the end i may at this time deal faithfully with you and acquaint you with the state of things and what proceedings have been entered into by this government and what the state of our affairs is this is the main end of my putting you to this trouble the government hath had some things in desire and it hath done some things actually it hath desired to reform the laws i say to reform them and for that end it hath called together persons without offence be it spoken of as great ability and as great interest as are in these nations to consider how the laws might be made plain and short and less chargeable to the people how to lessen expense for the good of the nation and those things are in preparation and bills prepared which in due time i make no question will be tendered to you in the meanwhile there hath been care taken to put the administration of the laws into the hands of just men men of the most known integrity and ability the chancery hath been reformed hath been reformed i hope to the satisfaction of all good men and as for the things or causes depending there which made the burden and work of the honourable persons entrusted in those services too heavy for their ability it hath referred many of them to those places where englishmen love to have their rights tried the courts of law at westminster this government hath farther endeavoured to put a stop to that heady way likewise touched of in our sermon this day of every man making himself a minister and preacher it hath endeavoured to settle a method for the approving and sanctioning of men of piety and ability to discharge that work and i think i may say it hath committed the business to the trust of persons both of the presbyterian and independent judgments of as known ability piety and integrity as any i believe this nation hath and i believe also that in that care they have taken they have laboured to approve themselves to christ to the nation and to their own consciences and indeed i think if there be anything of quarrel against them though i am not here to justify the proceedings of any it is that they in fact go upon such a character as the scripture warrants to put men into that great employment and to approve men for it who are men that have received gifts from him that ascended up on high and gave gifts for the work of the ministry and for the edifying of the body of christ the government hath also taken care we hope for the expulsion of all those who may be judged any way unfit for this work who are scandalous and the common scorn and contempt of that function one thing more this government hath done it hath been instrumental to call a free parliament which blessed be god we see here this day i say a free parliament and that it may continue so i hope is in the heart and spirit of every good man in england save such discontented persons as i have formerly mentioned it is that which as i have desired above my life so i shall desire to keep it above my life i did before mention to you the plunges we were in with respect to foreign states by the war with portugal france the dutch the danes and the little assurance we had from any of our neighbours round about i perhaps forgot but indeed it was a caution upon my mind and i desire now it may be so understood that if any good hath been done it was the lord not we his poor instruments i did instance the wars which did exhaust your treasure and put you into such a condition that you must have sunk therein if it had continued but a few months longer this i can affirm if strong probability may be a fit ground and now you have though it be not the first in time peace with swedland an honourable peace through the endeavours of an honourable person here present as the instrument i say you have an honourable peace with a kingdom which not many years since was much a friend to france and lately perhaps inclinable enough to the spaniard 
and i believe you expect not much good from any of your catholic neighbours nor yet that they would be very willing you should have a good understanding with your protestant friends yet thanks be to god that peace is concluded and as i said before it is an honourable peace you have a peace with the danes a state that lay contiguous to that part of this island which hath given us the most trouble and certainly if your enemies abroad be able to annoy you it is likely they will take their advantage where it best lies to give you trouble from that country but you have a peace there and an honourable one satisfaction to your merchants ships not only to their content but to their rejoicing i believe you will easily know it is so an honourable peace you have the sound open which used to be obstructed that which was and is the strength of this nation the shipping will now be supplied thence and whereas you were glad to have anything of that kind at second hand you have now all manner of commerce there and as much freedom as the dutch themselves who used to be the carriers and vendors of it to us and at the same rates and tolls and i think by that piece the said rates now fixed upon cannot be raised to you in future you have a piece likewise with the crown of portugal which piece though it hung long in hand yet is lately concluded it is a piece which your merchants make us believe is of good concernment to their trade the rate of insurance to that country having been higher and so the profit which could bear such rate then to other places and one thing hath been obtained in this treaty which never before was since the inquisition was set up here that our people which trade thither have liberty of conscience liberty to worship in chapels of their own indeed peace is as you were well told to-day desirable with all men as far as it may be had with conscience and honour we are upon a treaty with france and we may say this that if god give us honour in the eyes of the nations about us we have reason to bless him for it and so to own it and i dare say that there is not a nation in europe but is very willing to ask a good understanding with you i am sorry i am thus tedious but i did judge that it was somewhat necessary to acquaint you with these things and things being so i hope you will not be unwilling to hear a little again of the sharp as well as of the sweet and i should not be faithful to you nor to the interest of these nations which you and i serve if i did not let you know all as i said before when this government was undertaken we were in the midst of those domestic diversions and animosities and scatterings engaged also with those foreign enemies round about us at such a vast charge one hundred twenty thousand pounds a month for the very fleet which sum was the very utmost penny of your assessments ay and then all your treasure was exhausted and spent when this government was undertaken all accidental ways of bringing in treasure were to a very inconsiderable sum consumed the forfeited lands sold the sums on hand spent rents fee farms delinquents lands kings queens bishops dean and chapters lands sold these were spent when this government was undertaken i think it is my duty to let you know so much and that is the reason why the taxes do yet lie so heavy upon the people of which we have abated thirty thousand pounds a month for the next three months truly i thought it my duty to let you know that though god hath dealt thus bountifully with you yet these are but entrances and doors of hope whereby through the blessing of god you may enter into rest and peace but you are not yet entered you were told to-day of a people brought out of egypt toward the land of canaan but through unbelief murmuring repining and other temptations and sins wherewith god was provoked they were fain to come back again and linger many years in the wilderness before they came to the place of rest 
we are thus far through the mercy of god we have cause to take notice of it that we are not brought into misery not totally wrecked but have as i said before a door of hope open and i may say this to you if the lord's blessing and his presence go along with the management of affairs at this meeting you will be enabled to put the top stone to the work and make the nation happy but this must be by knowing the true state of affairs you are yet like the people under circumcision but raw your pieces are but newly made and it is a maxim not to be despised though peace be made yet it is interest that keeps peace and i hope you will not trust such peace except so far as you see interest upon it but all settlement grows stronger by mere continuance and therefore i wish that you may go forward and not backward and in brief that you may have the blessing of god upon your endeavors it is one of the great ends of calling this parliament that the ship of the commonwealth may be brought into a safe harbor which i assure you it will not be without your counsel and advice you have great works upon your hands you have ireland to look unto there is not much done to the planting thereof though some things leading and preparing for it are it is a great business to settle the government of that nation upon fit terms such as will bear that work through you have laid before you some considerations intimating your peace with several foreign states but yet you have not made peace with all and if they should see we do not manage our affairs with that wisdom which becomes us truly we may sink under disadvantages for all that is done and our enemies will have their eyes open and be revived if they see animosities among us which indeed will be their great advantage i do therefore persuade you to a sweet gracious and holy understanding of one another and of your business concerning which you had so good counsel this day which as it rejoiced my heart to hear so i hope the lord will imprint it upon your spirits wherein you shall have my prayers having said this and perhaps omitted many other material things through the frailty of my memory i shall exercise plainness and freeness with you and say that i have not spoken these things as one who assumes to himself dominion over you but as one who doth resolve to be a fellow-servant with you to the interest of these great affairs and of the people of these nations i shall trouble you no longer but desire you to repair to your house and to exercise your own liberty in the choice of a speaker that so you may lose no time in carrying on your work end of section twelve section thirteen of the world's famous orations volume three this is a librivox recording all LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The World's Famous Orations, Volume 3 Against Richard Cromwell by Sir Henry Vane Footnote Richard Cromwell was Oliver's son and his successor as protector. Vane's speech was delivered in Parliament in 1659 born in 1612, died in 1662, came to Massachusetts in 1635, governor of Massachusetts 1636 to 1637, returned to England and entered Parliament in 1640, made a commissioner to negotiate the Solemn League and Covenant with Scotland in 1643, member of the Council of State in 1649, in prison for an attack on the Protectorate of Cromwell in 1656, arrested and executed on a charge of treason in 1660 1659 among all the people of the universe i know none who have shown so much zeal for the liberty of their country as the english at this time have done they have by the help of divine providence overcome all obstacles and have made themselves free we have driven away the hereditary tyranny of the house of stuart at the expense of much blood and treasure in hopes of enjoying hereditary liberty after having shaken off the yoke of kingship 
and there is not a man among us who could have imagined that any person would be so bold as to dare to attempt the ravishing from us that freedom which cost us so much blood and so much labor. But so it happens, I know not by what misfortune, we are fallen into the error of those who poisoned the Emperor Titus to make room for Domitian, who made away Augustus that they might have Tiberius, and changed Claudius for Nero. I am sensible these examples are foreign from my subject, since the Romans in those days were buried in lewdness and luxury, whereas the people of England are now renowned all over the world for their great virtue and discipline. And yet, suffer an idiot without courage without sense nay without ambition to have dominion in a country of liberty one could bear a little with oliver cromwell though contrary to his oath of fidelity to the parliament contrary to his duty to the public contrary to the respect he owed that venerable body from whom he received his authority he usurped the government his merit was so extraordinary that our judgments our passions might be blinded by it he made his way to empire by the most illustrious actions. He had under his command an army that had made him conqueror, and a people that had made them their general. But as for Richard Cromwell his son, who is he? What are his titles? We have seen that he had a sword by his side, but did he ever draw it? And what is of more importance in this case is he fit to get obedience from a mighty nation who never could make a footman obey him. Yet we must recognize this man as our king, under the style of protector, a man without birth, without courage, without conduct. For my part, I declare, sir, it shall never be said that I made such a man my master. End of section 13. Recording by Philip Gould. Section 14 of the World's Famous Orations, Volume 3. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The World's Famous Orations, Volume 3. At His Trial for High Treason, by Sir Henry Vane. Footnote. Addressed to the Court of King's Bench, before which Vane, charged with high treason, was arraigned on June 2, 1662. Found guilty four days later, he was executed on June the 14th. In all things, said Pepys, he appeared the most resolved man that ever died in that manner. Abridged. End footnote. 1662. I am so far satisfied in my conscience and understanding that it neither is nor can be treason, either against the law of nature or the law of the land, either malum per se or malum prohibitum, that on the contrary it is the duty I owed to God the universal King and to His Majesty that now is, and to the Church and people of God in these nations, and to the innocent blood of all that have been slain in this quarrel. Nothing, it seems, will now serve unless, by the condemnation passed upon my person, they be rendered to posterity murderers and rebels, and that upon record in a court of justice in Westminster Hall. And this would inevitably have followed if I had voluntarily given up this cause, without asserting therein my innocency, by which I should have pulled that blood upon my own head which now I am sure lies at the door of others and in particular of those that knowingly and precipitately shall imbrue their hands in my innocent blood under whatsoever form or pretext of justice. My case is evidently new and unusual, that which never happened before, wherein there is not only much of God and of His glory, but all that is dear and of true value to all the good people in these three nations. And, as I have said, it cannot be treason against the law of nature, since the duties of the subjects in relation to their sovereigns and superiors from the highest to the lowest are owed and conscientiously practiced and yielded by those that are the asserters of this cause. Nor can it be treason within the statue of Edward the Third, since, besides what hath been said of no king in possession, and of being under powers regnant and kings de facto, as also of the fact in its own nature, and the evidence as to overt acts pretended, it is very plain that it cannot possibly fall within the purview of that statute. 
for this case thus circumstantiated as before declared is no act of any private person of his own head as that statute intends nor in relation to the king there meant that is presumed to be in the exercise of his royal authority in conjunction with the law and the two houses of parliament if they be sitting as the fundamental constitutions of the government do require my lords if i have been free and plain with you in this matter i beg your pardon for it concerns me to be so and something more than ordinarily urgent where both my estate and life are in such imminent peril nay more than my life the concerns of thousands of lives are in it not only of those that are in their graves already but of all posterity in time to come had nothing been in it but the care to preserve my own life i needed not have stayed in england but might have taken my opportunity to withdraw myself into foreign parts to provide for my own safety nor needed i to have been put upon pleading as i now am for an arrest of judgment but might have watched upon advantages that were visible enough to me in the managing of my trial if i had consulted only the preservation of my life or estate no my lords i have otherwise learned christ than to fear them that can kill but the body and have no more that they can do i have also taken notice in the little reading that i have had of history how glorious the very heathen have rendered their names to posterity in the contempt they had showed of death when the laying down of their lives has appeared to be their duty from the love which they have owed to their country end of section fourteen recording by philip gould section fifteen of the world's famous orations volume three this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The World's Famous Orations, Volume 3 Speech on the Scaffold by Algernon Sidney Footnote Spoken in London on the Scaffold, December 7, 1683 Sidney, Algernon, was tried at the King's Bench before the notorious Jeffreys, who, says C. H. Firth, wrangled with the prisoner and browbeat him in his usual fashion when sidney came to the scaffold evelyn says he told them not only that he had made his peace with god that he came not thither to talk but to die put a paper into the sheriff's hands and another into a friend's said one prayer as short as a grace laid down his neck and bid the executioner do his office born in sixteen twenty two died in sixteen eighty three wounded at the Battle of Marston in 1644, elected to Parliament in 1645, Lieutenant General of Horse in Ireland in 1646, Councillor of State in 1659, lived on the continent after the Restoration until 1677, falsely arrested and condemned to death for high treason in 1683. Men, brethren and fathers, friends, countrymen and strangers, it may be expected that I should now say some great matters unto you, but the rigor of the season and the infirmities of my age, increased by a close imprisonment of above five months, do not permit me. Moreover, we live in an age that maketh truth pass for treason. I dare not say anything contrary unto it, and the ears of those that are about me will probably be found too tender to hear it. My trial and condemnation sufficiently evidence this. West, Rumsey, and Keeling, who were brought to prove the plot, said no more of me than that they knew me not, and some others equally unknown to me had used my name and that of some others to give a little reputation unto their designs. Footnote. The Rye House plot of 1682-1683 was a conspiracy to kill Charles the Second and his brother, the Duke of York, afterwards James the Second, and thus may be said to have anticipated the revolution of 1688. It took its name from a house in Hertfordshire, where the conspirators met. The Lord Howard is too infamous by his life and the many perjuries not to be denied, or rather sworn by himself, to deserve mention, and being a single witness he would be of no value, though he had been of unblemished credit, or had not seen and confessed that the crimes committed by him would be pardoned only for committing more. 
and even the pardon promised could not be obtained till the drudgery of swearing was over. This being laid aside, the whole matter is reduced to the papers said to be found in my closet by the king's officers, without any other proof of their being written by me than what is taken from suppositions upon the similitude of a hand that is easily counterfeited, and which hath been lately declared in the Lady Carr's case to be no lawful evidence in criminal causes. But if I had been seen to write them, the matter would not be much altered. They plainly appear to relate unto a large treatise written long since in answer to Filmer's book, which, by all intelligent men, is thought to be grounded upon wicked principles, equally pernicious unto magistrates and people. If he might publish unto the world his opinion, that all men are born under a necessity derived from the laws of God and nature to submit unto an absolute kingly government, which could be restrained by no law or oath, and that he that hath the power, whether he came unto it by creation, election, inheritance, usurpation, or any other way, had the right, and none must oppose his will, but the persons and estates of his subjects must be indispensably subject unto it, I know not why I may not have published my opinion to the contrary without the breach of any law I have yet known. I might as freely as he have declared publicly my thoughts, and the reasons upon which they were grounded, and I am persuaded to believe that God has left nations unto the liberty of setting up such governments as best please themselves. The magistrates are set up for the good of nations, not nations for the honor and glory of magistrates. That the right and power of magistrates in every country is that which the laws of that country made it to be. That those laws were to be observed, and the oaths taken by them having the force of a contract between magistrate and people, could not be violated without danger of dissolving the whole fabric. That usurpation could give no right, and the most dangerous of all enemies unto kings were they who, raising their power to an exorbitant height, allowed unto usurpers all the rights belonging unto it that such usurpations being seldom compassed without the slaughter of the reigning person, or family, the worst of all villains was thereby rewarded with the most glorious privileges, that if such doctrines were received they would stir up men to the destruction of princes with more violence than all the passions that have hitherto raged in the hearts of the most unruly, that none could be safe, if such a reward were proposed unto any that could destroy them that few would be so gentle as to spare even the best, if by their destruction a vile usurper could become God's anointed, and by the most execrable wickedness invest himself with that divine character. By these means I am brought to this place. The Lord forgive these practices, and avert the evils that threaten the nation from them. The Lord sanctify these my sufferings unto me, and though I fall as a sacrifice unto idols, suffer not idolatry to be established in the land. Bless thy people and save them. Defend thy own cause and defend those who defend it. Stir up such as are faint. Direct those that are willing. Confirm those that waver. Give wisdom and integrity unto all. Order all things so as may most redound unto thine own glory. Grant that I may die glorifying thee for all thy mercies, and that at the last thou hast permitted me to be singled out as a witness of thy truth. And even by the confession of my opposers, for that old cause in which I was from my youth engaged, and for which thou hast often and wonderfully declared thyself. Footnote. Sidney was only twenty-two years of age at the Battle of Marston Moor, where he charged with much gallantry in the head of my Lord Manchester's regiment of horse, and came off with many wounds, the true badges of his honor. End of section 15 Recording by Philip Gould Section 16 of the World's Famous Orations, Volume 3 this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The World's Famous Orations, Volume 3 Speech on the Scaffold by Richard Rumbold Footnote Delivered in Edinburgh, Rumbold was captured after having been wounded and then separated from his companions in arms. An immediate trial had been ordered that he might be condemned before he died of his wounds. He was found guilty on June 26, 1685, sentenced to be executed the same afternoon, and was drawn and quartered, 
the quarters being exposed on the gates of English towns. End of footnote. Born about 1622, died in 1685. Served under Cromwell at Dunbar in Worcester, one of the guard about the scaffold of Charles I. Member of the Rye House Conspiracy in 1682. Indicted for treason but escaped. Served in Scotland under the Earl of Argyle in 1685. There captured, tried, condemned, and executed. It is for all men that come into the world once to die, and after death the judgment. And since death is a debt that all of us must pay, it is but a matter of small moment what way it be done. Seeing the Lord is pleased in this manner to take me to himself, I confess something hard to flesh and blood. Yet blessed be his name, who hath made me not only willing, but thankful for his honouring me to lay down the life he gave for his name, in which, were every hair in this head and beard of mine a life, I should joyfully sacrifice them for it as I do this. Providence having brought me hither, I think it most necessary to clear myself of some aspersions laid upon my name, and first, that I should have had so horrid an intention of destroying the king and his brother. It was also laid to my charge that I was anti-monarchical. It was ever my thoughts that kingly government was the best of all were justly executed. I mean, such as it was by our ancient laws, that is, a king and a legal free chosen parliament, the king having, as I conceive, power enough to make him great, the people also as much property as to make them happy, they being, as it were, contracted to one another. And who will deny me that this was not the justly constituted government of our nation? How absurd it is, then, for men of sense to maintain that though the one party of his contract break all conditions, the other should be obliged to perform their part. No. This error is contrary to the law of God, the law of nations, and the law of reason. But as pride hath been the bait the devil hath caught most by ever since the creation, so it continues to this day with us. Pride caused our first parents to fall from the blessed state wherein they were created, they aiming to be higher and wiser than God allowed, which brought an everlasting curse on them and their posterity. It was pride caused God to drown the old world, and it was Nimrod's pride in building Babel that caused the heavy curse of division of tongues to be spread among us as it is at this day, one of the greatest afflictions the church of God groaneth under, that there should be so many divisions during their pilgrimage here. But this is their comfort, that the day draweth near, where, as there is but one shepherd, there shall be but one sheepfold. It was, therefore, in the defense of this party, in their just rights and liberties, against popery and slavery. Footnote. At this point Rumbold was interrupted by drum-beating. He said he would say no more on that subject, since they were so disingenuous as to interrupt a dying man. End of footnote. I die this day in defense of the ancient laws and liberties of these nations, and though God, for reasons best known to himself, hath not seen it fit to honor us, as to make us the instruments for the deliverance of his people, yet as I have lived, so I die in the faith that he will speedily arise for the deliverance of his church and people. And I desire of you all to prepare for this with speed. I may say this is a deluded generation, veiled with ignorance that though popery and slavery be riding in upon them, do not perceive it. Though I am sure there was no man born marked of God above another, for none comes into the world with a saddle on his back, neither any booted and spurred to ride him. Not but that I am well satisfied that God hath wisely ordered different stations for men in the world, as I have already said, kings having as much power as to make them great, and the people as much property as to make them happy. And to conclude, I shall only add my wishes for the salvation of all men who were created for that end. End of section 16. Recording by Philip Gould.